Hello, everybody. My name is Peter Bond from the 10 Very Big Books podcast. And with me today is Malazan YouTuber Iskar Jarak. Hello. And welcome to this uh, show and our discussion of the Ian Cameron Esselmont's Night of Knives and our discussion of uh, the novels of the Malazan Empire. So we're starting here with the first one. And... Uh, we're going to get right into it pretty quick. The show's going to be structured about like this. We're going to first talk through Night of Knives particularly. Then we're going to move on, talk about different comments and feedback from the community we got, and then end discussing bigger questions about where this book falls into the broader Malazan series and um, having having a discussion more on Ian Cameron Esselmont as an author. And I'm really looking forward to that. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later on but i didn't come up with a name for this little mini series you know i tried really hard but we just kind of ended up saying we're gonna have a night of knives discussion i think we did we never really named it yeah what we did well you know i'm a i'm the spread i'm the spreadsheet nerd of us i think and so uh, I'm, I'm the wrong one to look to for for creativity unfortunately yeah i'll tell you a little bit more about why we struggled to name it later on but um i think we should just maybe get straight into the hot discussion. Yeah. I would love to know when you first read Night of Knives, what of the other Esmon books have you read? And uh, and then maybe get into what it was like to reread it this time. Because if I'm not mistaken, you reread it for the show today. Yeah, I read it just for just for fun. So uh, I read it after I did the, the main 10. And that's actually something I'd like to get into with you, I think, is just like your take on, on the reading order. Because I read through the you know the main 10 and i get chided in the discord all the time for calling it the main 10 but uh you know i i read the malazan book of the fallen and then i'm sitting there like kind of processing and decompressing going online trying to make sense of everything that i just took in and and found that there was this whole other series of books by this other author. And so I just dove straight in and I went uh, back to back to back with the ice books and I loved it. I didn't even realize that, uh, and I actually want to make a video, I think about just kind of bigging up the, the ice books because I love them so much. I feel like there's a real um, Ganos Tavor analogy there between like, Erickson and Ice, where, you know, even if you listen to the Erickson interviews and stuff, he's always um, deferring to to Ice on like, you know, his note taking and the details and all of that stuff. Um, and yet for for whatever reason, the, the Erickson stuff is the more popular and he's like the more revered. But, uh, you know, I, I dove in and, and read the whole thing you know, and, and absolutely loved it. And I actually love it even more having just reread it. I just think it's uh, a lot of fun and I'm a sucker for the lore and the backstory. And I think that's what this, this one delivers on in spades. Yeah. So we'll have to talk more night and night and knives to be specific, but to kind of address your point, I have read, so we're going to read through the novels, of the Malzahn empire, but I have actually read the first three because um, I know there's a lot of takes about how you should read the series. Mm -hmm. I actually now generally feel like you maybe you should read all 10 straight through. But on my read through, I weaved Night of Knives, Return of the Crimson Guard and Stonewielder into the first read. And I largely feel like the first two I didn't regret, but Stonewielder I kind of regretted weaving in for various reasons I'm sure we can talk about later on. Sure. And it's at this point that I did want to note that for this reason, I think it's probably worthwhile to... I don't think we should spoil anything past book six, right? Okay. Yeah, fair play. I don't think we need to. I don't think we need to, and I think it would be good because I think some people do make that decision. So we may oh. reference some stuff, but I don't think we're going to discuss the whole series in spoilers until we get past we get we get past that point. Readers know what I'm talking about. Agreed. So that being said, to now address kind of more your point, uh, and then we can get into Night of Knives specifically. I don't want to say it's a hot take because, you know, I host this Malazan podcast. Mm. You ha we're on, we're making a Mal another Malazan miniseries, you know, we're in the community. But 
I think the book is pretty good, and I like Esselmont's writing, and I like the book. I think it's a good time, and I think that's a bit of a hot take because I would say he's actually a pretty divisive. People have a lot of different opinions about him. Do you know what I mean? Uh, especially even within the Maladane community. Absolutely. No, I, I'm like Team Ice, and that's why I want to make this video bigging it up because I think, you know, it's it's a lot of fun. And even though I, I tend to be a purist and think everybody should do it the way I did, which was just to stumble onto the, the Book of the Fallen and read all 10 at once, I, I think for folks who struggle or don't know what to expect getting into the book of the fallen and just kind of the open-ended nature of it and things like that you know this this kind of storytelling is is actually i think a good introduction into the malazan world because you're getting a lot of that backstory and and lore and it's kind of a a a story i think that folks can get their heads wrapped around and like you said it's it's a lot of fun just kind of plot wise too yeah but these are all kind of big picture. How should we think about the Esselmont books? What do they mean for the larger setting? How should people? How should readers read them? I think we should set those questions aside for a little later in the show sure. and come to the book at hand, Knight of Knives, which obviously directly tells about the ascension of Kellenved and Dancer to the Shadow Throne and through the eyes of the kind of young urchin thief mage i don't you know something like that kiska and the older veteran temper yep um on this night of the shadow moon on malaz isle so um what do you think of this book it's the first one i love it like i said i'm a i'm a sucker for the backstory and i love the layers you know it's kind of this one's kind of an onion right because on the surface of it you have the kind of worldly <laughs> struggle if you will right it's all about the kind of ascension basically to the throne, the making of Lacine or whatever from Surly, um, and that whole you know power struggle, I guess, or or you know with with them having been basically MIA for ages, um, and her yeah. her deciding to to take over. But then you have the kind of um, you know the ascendant piece where it's like that second layer where they're really gunning for that that bigger prize. But then you kind of have that third more existential layer, which is the the kind of Jenna Stormriders. Piece where they you know kind of have made this deal with the devil as well and so i like it because it has so many different layers and you're kind of walking through it with these new characters who i actually love both characters i know kiska gets a lot of she gets for some reason lumped together with kyle and crocus but uh, i really enjoy the character and i love temper yeah, Kiska, I think, is unfairly dunked on sometimes. Um, but yeah, we can talk about that later. I, too, uh, like the book a good deal. Um, it's short, and it mostly um, is in, out, doesn't overstay its welcome. It's just, it's done, you know? It's it's so, it's a quick, easy, fast read, and it's mostly pretty fun, you know? Yeah. Um, I also largely, it's worth noting, you mentioned the Storm Riders subplot, which I think is pretty um, spiritual. Yeah. And uh, additionally, I think there's a real element of horror in that subplot, especially when you talk about the man on the boat or uh, kind of near the epilogue, yep. um, near the end of the book. And I kind of do think Esselmont does a great job of making some things horrifying, especially the Hounds of Shadow when they later show up. Yeah. Because the hounds are not always portrayed as terrifying. I think a lot of the times Erickson is more conveying their power. And I feel like um, Cam is, uh, I, I might just start calling him Cam. Anyway, I feel like Esselman is um, highlighting a kind of diff different aspect of the hounds. And I really like that. And I think, um, I don't know, that's just something that sprung to my mind when you mentioned the Storm Riders. Yeah. But overall, I think it's a really interesting, I don't know. I don't know if I would say I feel like the Storm Riders thing is the most is one of the more thoughtful parts of the book. Do you know what I mean? And I feel like a lot of it is there's a lot of other stuff that is more action and a lot of fun and is really I get a lot out of reading, but it's not necessarily introspective or pushing on me in that spiritual way as some of that Storm Riders imagery. Yeah, definitely. And in, in some ways, this kind of explores some of the the stuff that are that's explored, I guess, in in Book of the Fallen. So this is kind of like Esselmont's way of, of diving into to some of those issues about just like otherness and, and things like that, too. And I think that it's easy to miss that part, right? Because you can kind of get wrapped up in the whole 
quick progression of it all in terms of the whole night progression, right? And Kiska and Temper progressing through the actual events and and miss these bigger thematic things, I think, that are happening because they're they really are kind of the the existential stuff, right? And you see that with uh with Artan or whatever towards the end when he actually, you yeah. know, kind of comes in with a really smug attitude and then ends up uh you know kind of realizing the gravity and I think that's that's kind of what you were getting at with the hound stuff too, right? Is that um Esselmont really uses the hounds to kind of establish the value of the prize almost or or the the magnitude of it or the gravity of it and and that's pretty cool. I think that's a great point. I want to ask specifically about how you feel about kind of the two central characters of the book. But first, I want to pose you this question. Since Gardens of the Moon, this night is discussed in the series, do you mean? And coming into it, obviously, the impressions the reader has about the mythic, almost mythic quality of this night, you know, and of the legend of it and this ascension kind of hangs over the reader going into it, right? It probably drives their interest in reading the book. And I wonder how you feel the book matches or do you think it rises to the occasion of meeting this mythic quality of Kelenved, of Dancer, of Surly ascending to the being the Empress, of them ascending to the Shadow Throne? Do you know, does it match the stakes of that myth? You know, I, I, I love it because, and this is why I, I don't necessarily get all the, the kind of Esselmont hate that I've I've seen online and things like that, is that, you know, it, it to me, this is classic, you know, Malazan, because you're, you're seeing this kind of uh, legend, right, and history that's, you know, uh, kind of vaunted, right, by the time that we're um, entering into the series at the, at the kind of natural entry point but but really when you go back and explore these things in the same way that like once you really um, go back and explore the beginnings of the bridge burners that you hear so much about at the beginning of gardens of the moon um, you know it's it's a much more kind of uh i don't want to say pedestrian you know what i mean but it was a it's a much more like nuts and bolts kind of mechanical thing that that happened organically than that what the the legend would have you believe and i think this kind of peels back the the curtain on on the legend in some ways because if you really think about like the climax uh, of the book right it's it's kind of not that exciting right she tries to take him out she has the odotarl dust they go out the window she thinks they're dead that's kind of it right and uh and so you, you you kind of see that that it really is just more of the Again, with everything with Malaz, and I feel like it's it's all about the journey, not the destination. And everyone's like so overly obsessed with the destination because that's how we've been trained for reading other books. But it's really all the stuff along the way that really made it so juicy. I think you're dead on. I think um, I don't know if it's purposeful, but it certainly feels so. And it's definitely deflating the myth of this ascension and of what actually happened on this night. And I think pedestrians actually, I would describe, I think that's a great word to describe it. Not that it's boring, but yeah. um, I mean, it's certainly more boring than when these knights are like a legend and it's, you know, oh, yes. the emperor was assassinated. And there was, you know, it can all sound so, such like high melodrama, but it's just kind of more boring than that in a way, you know? Yeah, even the debrief, right? Like Tayshren's just sitting downstairs, like chilling around the, the table and then he like cruises up, checks out what's happening and goes, oh, OK, and they kind of like, you know, pull out the tape measures for a second. And then he goes back down and like continues with, you know, on his day. Yeah, which I think is actually it's a really challenging task. And I haven't read Path to Ascension, but I do know the series, I think, as people have mixed opinions about it. Right. Um, which they're and, wrong. I love it. I can't speak to it, but I think there's a real thing that they are pressing on, and that I think it's what we're talking about, that the image of Kelenved, especially since we do see Cotillion a fair bit in the main series, the image of Kelenved hangs over as such like a big legend. It like is the ghost that haunts the Empire. Do you mm. know what I mean? Yep. Um, so it is kind of really big shoes to fill, and I can understand readers feeling let down or disappointed that, you know... 
Kellen Ved isn't that or that this book isn't epic in that way. And there's, you know, that sometimes these epic scenes are deflated. You know, I get feeling left out sure. in the cold about that. Yeah, you're used to kind of thousand page tones where this, you know, all this crazy uh, monumental stuff happens. But for me, again, I think when you zoom it out and think about it and just in the context of, of the books, I think that's one of the messages of the world, too, right, is that like the gods are uh, human. In fact, I think maybe there's, you, you could argue, and, and Ruth Ann Bad has a video where he does, I think, argue about how, um, in some ways, the gods are more human, right? They're like even more fallible and human. And that kind of, I think, that's that's a cool part about this whole pulling the, the veil back on that is that the, you know, they're... Uh, they're not these omniscient, omnipotent, like altruistic, <laughs> perfect beings. Although I think the myths are discussed in a different tone usually, I feel like there's a real comparison between the Greek gods in that mythic sense to these gods and how often they're just like coming down and doing total rogue shit that is like, you know, Zeus being a goose having sex with people or whatever, you know? Yeah. Um, no, I, I think that's bang on, you know, it's like, that's kind of the, the whole point. And that's like a way that we can investigate our own humanity and stuff. You know, everybody talks about the empathy and compassion and all that is like, you know, you're, you're putting yourself in, in their shoes, definitely. And, and trying to, uh, you know, reverse engineer the, the motivations. And so I, yeah. I, I love it because there's so many layers. And I think, you know, even just the, the kind of mundane stuff, like, the, the kind of wink at temper at the end as he like goes into the house, you know, um, that's just classic like ego and, you know, that's pure human right there, even as a, you know, his last act as a human. Exactly. And, and, and you know, I don't, uh, you know, it's fun to joke about it as I did, but I do want to underline, as you're saying, I think there's a really well-written aspect there where I think something I've always loved about it the setting is that the gods are often invoking, you know, what it would mean to encounter death in a real way when you talk about hood or what what it means to, I don't know, I think there's a, a, a more a powerful thematic element that is usually broached when they write about these gods. Mm -hmm. And I think, which brings me to the biggest point I wanted to make about that is that I think the element of ascension and what it means to ascend, I think, is really draped in this book. And I think it's a through line that I think is well tended to. So, I mean, be it Surly, be it Kiska, you know, be it obviously Kellenved and Dancer, you know, what it means to um, transcend yourself or prove yourself or escape yourself. I mean, I think these are things that are uh, on the mind of the novel. Yeah, definitely. And I, I, that's why I love the kind of edgewalker part of this book too, because he's kind of that impartial third party who's sitting there going, I've seen, you know, all these, these attempts and things like that and they come and go and, uh, yeah, there's, you know, it's it's all about, you know, the the kind of force of of nature, the the power of the will and proving yourself and all of that stuff and then he's kind of uh, has the perspective of eons, right? And uh, and can kind of laugh about it all. Kind of an indifference in a way. Yeah. Now, I want to talk about Kiska and Temper, but I did want to just note, I think Edgewalker may be one of my favorite characters in the whole setting, you know? I just feel like he has such big, almost Tom Bombadil energy. I don't know. He's just like, what is he? Who knows? But he hangs out and he talks and has a big, I just like, I love him. You know, I love unexplained stuff. So I love Edgewalker. Me too. And, you know, he sees like all this stuff and he's just a hundred percent cold as ice, right? Like former uh, rulers of shadow who are now chained down. He laughs. He sees, you know, all these people coming to usurp the throne. He's not bothered. And that's why, like, I, again, coming back to the Storm Riders bit, you know, like that was the one thing that happened. Had Edgewalker shook in this book, and I think that that's something that you know it's a, it's a really minor piece of this book, but it's a, it's an important and like significant thing, not just for for this book, but and honestly, I for me that's one of the biggest enigmas still of the whole series. You know, is the is the Storm Rider piece, and I forgot how prominent they were in this book, but I love I love how he's both able to shrug off almost everything and that scares the crap out of him yeah exactly 
So I think uh, I want to move on to the que- uh, discussing community feedback and everything. I think it'll be a great co- way to further conversation. But first, let's talk about the two main characters of the book, because as we mentioned, it's kind of focused on such mythic things. So obviously, there's this question that looms over it in my mind. This night is about Kellenved and Dancer, right? And about Surly, like yeah. the way we know it. And the arguably these people are still the most important aspects of this night. Yet the story is told through the points of view of Kiska and Temper. So to start with Kiska, I wonder what you make of her character, and I wonder if you think her character holds the weight of a novel and holds the weight of being able to frame this story of Ascension. That's an interesting question. I think that she definitely lightens the tone in some ways just because she is I mean, this is Esselmont's crocus, right? If you if you think about it, she's a thief. She's a teenager. She's kind of um, struggling with all this internal, you know, self-confidence conflicts, you know, being confronted with the reality and all of that stuff. Um, and so she she kind of, I feel like, lightens the tone because she's oblivious in some ways to the, like, magnitude, right? Like, she doesn't have the perspective that we have as readers, like, coming in and understanding the the significance of the events that she's witnessing, right? When Artan yeah. meets with, uh, I forget, Oleg at the beginning, right? And we're like, oh, my God, this is like, right? She doesn't get it at all. But... At the same time, from from the standpoint of kind of if the the purpose is, as we were saying before, to humanize or to, to kind of demystify the legend, then I think it actually works well as the vehicle to do that because you're just kind of riding shotgun with her and you're like, oh, my gosh, do you even realize like what you're witnessing right now? And, uh, you know, it, that whole thing with temper coming in and storming mox hold and all that she thinks it's this crazy demon and all that and we're like laughing about it because we know and everything but you know i i think it works for for that standpoint it just doesn't work for the people who come in and expect the esomont books to be like toll the hounds or something like that yeah which we can talk more about readers' expectations later. I think that's a really important point. And to me, I like Kiska and all. I, you know, I enjoy reading her parts of the book. I, you know, I told you I enjoy the book, but I don't think she's that substantial of a character. And I, I pretty much feel that way about Temper too. But I think Esselman is in this difficult position where I think if he just writes the story from Kellen and Dancer's point of view, like there's a version of this novel that's just like a Wikipedia article. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And yeah. just like describing something that happened. And I think the book firmly avoids that trap. You know, it is not just like a boring thing telling us what we already know, you know? Yeah, I don't um, know if you're a fan of Office Space or not, but it needs the kind of Peter character from Office Space, right? The, sure, sure. That, that movie isn't about Peter at all, but it really needs Peter in it, right? Because it's all about his crazy friends and, uh, you know, his his girlfriend, Milton, the other guy who works at the office, and all the, but you need him there to be kind of like the bus driver that takes you from event to event. And, and so... Uh, I, I think she does do that. I'm a sucker for temper because I'm like that kind of gooey moral center kind of a character. And, and for me, that's that's kind of uh, Esselmont's fiddler. And I, I think he knocked it out of the park. I, I get the feels for that guy as a middle aged kind of balding, fat, white guy. I, I aspire to be a temper like character. <laughs> No, I totally get that. And I agree. Temper, um, I think out of the two, I think Temper's probably the more developed character. But I think that's because Esmond spends more time developing the character. But I like Kiska more. But it's as you're saying, I think you're dead on. They kind of need to drive the bus of the story in a way. Even though their decisions aren't really driving the story, you know, and mostly they usually are making decisions that affect kind of what's going on in the titular Night of Knives. But I think it kind of 
needs to be from that outside perspective in a way. So I think they do a good job of that. And I think it makes me more excited, honestly, to read books. And that's something I really liked once you get into discussing later in some of Esselman's books, characters that are fully his creation and are kind of out from the shadow of something like Kellen Bed's Ascension. Yeah, and I think he 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 continues to grow and it's cliche, but I, I think Kiska grows a lot more. Like, honestly, I think if you held Kiska and Crocus up next to each other, I think Kiska is a, a more enjoyable uh, character, honestly. And I think her growth arc is is better and I can relate to her more. She, you know, is an overconfident youth who kind of gets a a firm dose of of reality and is able to kind of find some humility and stuff towards the end, you know what I mean? And just to kind of be grateful for uh, and recognize, you know, the presence that she's in and the opportunity that she has there to make an impression and things like that. So uh, I can can relate. I wish I would have been like that composed once you realized you were kind of being an ass and, and, you know, are able to recover that quickly. Honestly, I got to give her props for that. We can't get into it, but I got to say, Crocus is my favorite character. There's no way Chris Kiska is better than him. And we'll just move right on. You know, I can respect your opinion. Um, I accept your apology. <laughs> now, Temper, you admitted you had a lot of uh, admiration for him. I do too. I think he's a fun character in the story. But um, we have to talk about it before we move on to the kind of listener part of it. What do you make of the large temper flashback scenes that probably make up maybe the middle 20 percent? I don't know. It's it's a large part of the book. God bless him. I'm a humongous fan. I don't I'm not a. Again, I'm, I come at this from a life perspective of being a, a spreadsheet nerd, so I don't know anything about how you're supposed to write books or literary stuff or anything like that. But, uh, you know, I, I love going back and investigating that. I think for me, if there was a scene that was crying out to be animated and just done as like a five to six minute short that is it. If I ever get enough patrons to pay someone to do it, I'm just going to do it and put it on my YouTube because that scene is dope where he goes back and uh, the champion of Yugaton and then Temper picking up the mantle and all that. That is just an epic scene. It's a character who we, you know, that's a legendary character who like stands up to the expectation. And so this is one of our only windows into someone who actually kind of has a, a finger on the pulse of that character. So I loved it. Absolutely. In a way, it, it, it's showing one of his his kind of actions there are kind of one of the moments of kind of true mythic ascension in the way that's kind of contrasted to kind of a deflation of a myth in Kellen Bed and Dancer. I never thought about it like that, but that's absolutely spot on, honestly, because, you know, the Sem is for me, he, you know, and, and that's why I like the moral center people like your fiddlers and tempers and stuff is because even you know in this book right like tempers like i got no business doing this like corin um who was actually there and could probably fend for herself better than he could even defend her you know what i mean but he's just kind of like steps up to the mantle i'm not like those characters in any way but you kind of aspire to be like that right like the noble take it on the chin take one for the team uh type of characters greater good type of characters who's just like good at what they do and can get the job done and step into the gap and all that stuff and so uh yeah i'm i'm a sucker for that and i think you knocked that out of the park yeah i um I think that sequence is really good, but I am definitely mindful. As I mentioned, I think the book, this book at its worst could be just a Wikipedia article or something, right? And I think there's a version of this Yigatan stuff that, you know, is this just backstory for backstory's sake? Do you know what I mean? Like, is that, I think that's a question that if I really wanted to be, um, I think at its worst would be what the, what, what, what I would accuse it of, right? Mm-hmm. But I think... I do think since it's centered on Temper's character there and also about Dasim at this moment where he really ascend, transcends into legend, right, when um, at the Battle of Yucatan, yeah. um, I, I think it really connects thematically to the book, but 
I'm also aware that it's not really a part of the events of the night. So, yeah, I, 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 I like the section a lot, but I do wonder about, I don't know, I guess I'm still a little confused about its place in the story outside of that thematic connection and its relationship to Temper's character. But yes, I, no, I, I get that. And I can totally see where you're coming from as somebody who um, consumes a lot of literature and knows about books and, and things like that. But uh, I, I don't, I, don't, don't put the burden of expertise on me, sir. You've read more, you've read more of these mouths and books. Than I. <laughs> but Hey, I, I, I don't, uh, I don't count against the guy for throwing some red meat at the at the crowd because honestly i think like you said it's thematically connected and just uh enjoyable so for me i i think it was still a w and that's gonna bring me to my final thought before we move on to the listener feedback is my concern there about is this just backstory for backstory's sake is often snuffed out because generally i'm having a great time reading this book especially in the middle section because i love learning about the egaton stuff so whilst i guess i'm still a bit hesitant about that i still really the book's fun that's how i feel you know and I like the Book of the Fallen and all the, those ten, but I would I don't know how often Erickson's writing is fun. You know, not always is my answer. Yeah, even when it's funny or it's action or something, I don't know if I would say it's fun. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. No, and I, I, I love this as being both fun and funny. I think there's a lot of humor in this book that maybe he doesn't get credit for uh, as as well. I think that, you know, Temper's a funny character. I think there's a lot of funny moments in this book, too. But, uh, no, I, I I think that that these ones read like, you know, these ones lend themselves the most towards adaptation honestly, right? Because there's a beginning, a middle, and an end to these, and there's a plot progression, and it's fast-paced. Um, and and so, like you said, it's, it's actually fun. All right. With all of our feelings out of the way, let's move on to respond to some community feedback. We asked people to send in some questions or just their thoughts on Night of Knives from the podcast Twitter and on our uh, both of our discords and on the subreddit. So we're pulling from a lot of places. I've compiled a lot of lists here. I'm going to start and then let's just go back and forth answering some questions and uh, pulling out some ones that catch our eye. Awesome. All right. Here is uh, what I labeled as the hottest of takes by Bad Day J on the subreddit. And that is that Night of Knives is a better intro to the series than Garden of the Moon. What do you think, Iskar? I said that earlier. I think that for folks who maybe don't know what to expect getting in, that this could be a good entry point because, again, it's got a beginning, middle, and end. It's fast-paced. It's fun. It's not something that's totally out of left field where you don't know what to expect. The only reason why I would say no is, and I don't know, I, I'd be curious because you mixed all these in while you were reading the first time, but uh, the the kind of, I forget which one is which, but in this book he goes by Artan, and in Memories of Ice he goes by Arthanos or vice versa. Wouldn't that be a big spoiler? That's the only thing I worry about. Hmm, interesting. I guess I'm not worried about it from the spoiler point of view. I just think Gardens of the Moon, a book I'm not even that hot on, is a way better intro to the series, and I think absolutely the starting place with Malazan, you know? I, so I'm, I'm curious. Even... They both say, you know, if you ask, they say go publication order, um, and, and you know, that's, like, for me, I wouldn't have appreciated the Esselmont stuff as much if I wouldn't have had had the curiosity from reading Book of the Fallen first. Yeah, I mean, I like this book a lot. I just think Gardens of the Moon, I think, is uh, not only a stronger intro to the series, a stronger work. And um, yeah, I don't know. I have such, that's a whole separate thing. I just have such complicated feelings about that book. And um, yeah, we'll leave it there. I like Gardens of the Moon, but also some days, you know, I do think it's an interesting introduction to the series. Well, I just, uh, you know, the, for me, would you, without having read the Gardens of the Moon prologue, 
would you have the appreciation for even caring about the double cross and things like that in the first place? And so I think they're very much complimentary, but I think that uh, there's something to be said for honoring the wishes of the authors themselves. I agree. And I also think there's a real point as you're making out even side of the quality of the books or whatever. I mean, and what qualities to forefront. I just think like, I don't know how invested you're going to be in the Knight of Knives story if you don't even know who Kellen Vett is or if you don't know who Surly is. Do you mean, I I don't know. I could see you getting invested in this book, but I feel like you kind of need that myth to hang over you if you're going to enter the story. Yeah, the whole point is like, right, you've seen Lacine and Whiskey Jack kind of pulling out the tape measures and that that day above the mouse quarter and, and all of that stuff. And then so it's all about going back and kind of unpacking that scene that really set the stage for everything and and kind of uh, in some ways getting inside the head of where Whiskey Jack was at, right? And getting all that context and perspective, but really... Uh, in some ways, we we kind of level up by even having more inside information. And so, I, I you know, again, I, I will defend to the death. I will die on that hill for my purest uh, publication order, reading order. Yeah. What's a question that jumps out to you? Oh, yeah. Here's an easy one. So we got a question from Benoit Poulin MTL that says... Uh, How easy was it for you two to know when Night of Knives happened regarding Malazan Book of the Fallen Timeline? For me, this was 100% premeditated. I went in knowing that I was going to find out uh, backstory. And I think that's kind of the the moral of the story with a lot of the Esselmont stuff is like, you know, these are like side branches exploring things that are just barely touched on. And I think in his recent interview, he even said that where he takes little stuff that is kind of just only mentioned in his books and Esselmont takes that and blows it out and really just builds it out into a three dimensional model. Yeah, I agree. I fully knew I like was part of the what reading order should you have discussion. So I just kind of knew where we were going when I started it. Um, Here's a comment from Discord user Donal. I'm definitely glad I read Night of Knives and continued on with the ice books, but boy, it was a slog to get through. It felt so thrown together and haphazard. The word pulpy comes to mind, but not in a good way. Now that I know the characters and Malaz Sedi a bit better, a reread might be okay, but I'm not sure if I want to. Um, Cold take, what do you think? I, I feel that. And, and I get it, you know, for me, I think that uh, if you come into this, that that's the the downside, right? Because I, I do think you could go publication order, you read a big chunk of the main book of the fallen, and then you come and read some of these books and then go back in and you don't know what to expect because the tone is a lot different. The writing style is a lot different. But for me, I think that I don't know what pulpy means, honestly, no offense to you. That's my lack of vocabulary. But I think that um, A, you'll enjoy it a lot more on on a reread but for me i i felt like he could have gone longer like i feel like knight of knives could have been fleshed out into a more like an eight nine hundred page book and same thing with all of his books i i kind of wanted more he he does a good job but he could have been a little bit more generous with the uh descriptions maybe or or all the connective tissues and just kind of all that extra superfluous, you know, kind of fatty goodness. Yeah, I I get you. I think the book is a good size as it is. And I actually, to, to kind of go against this, although I, you know, I really get not liking this book. You know, I understand, you know, I feel like it's kind of pulpy, but to me in a good way. Do you know what I mean? I kind of love it for it's just kind of those elements of it. You know, I enjoy having fun in the setting and playing around in this space. You know, I think he does a good job with it. So. Um, yeah, and I, I thought it was pretty fast paced. So for me, the slog part is is the part that I would take issue with because again, I I think this this went pretty pretty quick. I think you could question some of the things that you did about like where does this flashback belong in this story and things like that, which I think was maybe a bit of a red meat element. But uh, but I think it was pretty pretty fast paced at least. Let me. Uh, I agree. I the the. 
I think it's a pretty quickly paced book. Um, so let me read this. Uh, let me read this Reddit comment, and then I'll hear a question. It, to to go against kind of what I said, the biggest flaw of the book. Oh, this is from Reddit user Redemption Y Land. The biggest flaw of the book is how the flashback, dash some stuff in the middle, is so good compared to the main story. The two main characters are fine, but I expected something more like path to ascendancy for the main narrative, and that's definitely not what we got. I'm a little disappointed now, though, that we did get better stories with Kel and Bed and Dancer at the center, despite the slight decline in quality for each of those. So the existence of those books helped me appreciate Night of Knives as the fun little horror adventure it is. Um... <laughs> I agree. Fun little horror adventure could be, I think, is a great description. Learn about this mythic knight. But it's interesting that he thinks the Dasim stuff's the strongest stuff in the book, which I think it's the part that leaves the biggest impression on me. But I don't think it's stronger than, I don't know, I wouldn't call it the strongest part. No, I I, I honestly, uh, God bless this this, uh, commenter, because I, I can totally relate. And I think that it says more about who we are as readers coming into this right because that's the area that we care about right and and in some ways and in my discord this is a hot subject of debate right is like uh and i put out a video about lacine and how she maybe could have approached the whole thing in a better way that wouldn't have led to this whole catastrophe but uh and people were like no you know Decem was the rightful heir and could have taken it down. And I think that's just an area that we care about, right? And this kind of reinforces that whole thing that we get through the first maybe three year. And I think we talked about this even in our House of Chains or, or maybe our Memories of Ice spoiler cast that we did where, you know, we talked about the kind of whole first three books building Lucene up as this villain and then you slowly start to chip away at that but for us as readers uh, by the time you get the full story you know it's already too late in a lot of ways uh, but but you know I, I I think this is kind of symptomatic of that right is that we really see Desem as that that good character that moral character as the better one to have taken things over and and maybe that's why we think this was the the better part it was just the juicier part because it was the part we already had a vested interest in before we even opened up the book I agree I think it's the juicier part not necessarily the better part what's a question stands out to you I I like the stuff about uh well let me look at this one cuz actually I think Fid the other has a has a good question which says how do you guys feel about the change of narrative pace Night of Knives basically takes place during one long day in the Malazan world which is a far cry from the main books quote unquote I he didn't put the quotes or she but they say where the paragraphs can span days weeks and possibly months at times. Did you find the more grounded style refreshing? Personally, I really enjoyed getting to see the world of Malaz from a more banal point of view. And I think that is a really interesting point and a beautifully written question as well. But, um, you know, you're often dealing in the in the Book of the Fallen with long time. And I think Erickson just had a big, long essay about time in the world and so it is a big change of pace and that's what makes it fun for me right is it like you're just kind of riding shotgun through this one kind of wild and crazy night and and that's what makes it so easy to read i mean you could pick up this book and read it in a day if you wanted to and it would be a blast and then you could come back and read it again and again so i think it kind of has that nice hybrid mix of like being a a book of the fallen book that has revisitable qualities if that's a word but also being fast paced enough just to be a, a fun night wild ride riding shotgun i agree i think it's a pro i mean the fact that it's kind of about the momentum of one night i think is a is a strong element of the book and if anything, that's one of those things that makes me question about the temper flashback because it makes me feel like par- is part of the story is about the rapid fire action of the night. Um, but that's just a little hesitation. But here's a question from Hip Katie. She asks us, what do we think about the weather on Malaz Island? And I got to tell you, uh, I think it's cold, rainy and miserable. And I think it's all part of the harbor like, I don't know. 
I feel like it being near the ocean, and uh, maybe it's just because I'm reading Midnight Tides now, I feel like uh, Esselmont's drawing on a lot of sea imagery. Yeah, I went to uh, to Marbella once, and I kind of get those vibes where it's like just uh, muggy harbor town, that kind of thing. And so for me, I'm... Uh, I, I don't do good in the heat. I'm I'm I wouldn't be a Malaz Isle. I'd be out kind of venturing and, and seeing what I could explore. So Captain Britton asks, What did you think about the presentation of characters you recognize? Did they line up with your previous impressions of them? Did anything about them surprise you? Did you wish you had learned anything more or less about them, or was it just right? And I think it goes to this question that I kind of framed the beginning of the discussion around about the mythic qualities of characters like Kellenbed. And to me, it definitely, as we said, deflates them. Um, but I actually, it makes me really keen to read Path to Ascendancy or um, just some other stuff with those characters to get them kn- get to know them on a more personal level. Because I still think even in a book like this, someone like, you know, Das Maltor or Surly are still held at a distance. Do you know what I mean? It's not like these books are about those characters. 100%. Yeah, no, I, I think for me, I, I, I still think that they're, you know, you're, you're, you're barely seeing a glimpse that you don't get any internal perspectives of the really juiciest characters. And so they're very much kept at arm's length. And I think that still leaves a lot, you know, it kind of wets the appetite, but also uh, leaves, you know, still a lot of, uh, a lot of question marks. And so there's still a lot that we, we we don't know for sure. Agreed. Moving on. To build on this demystifying thing, here is a, a kind of a longer post from CMATS90 off of Reddit. I think Knight of Knives only had to do one thing right, and it kind of botched it. While Kotlin Ved's death and ascendancy is correctly a pretty small part of the book by page count, it's kind of the reason for the book to exist at all, and it's such a letdown. From the Book of the Fallen, what we glean is that Lacine and the Claw apparently assassinated Kellen Ved in a coup, but that Kellen Ved actually ascended to godhood. We see several instances of ascendancy in the series that is precipitated by the physical death of a character, so it seemed natural to me that the same had happened to Kellenved and Dancer. It conjured the image of Lacine gloating over her rival's corpses, unaware that she had been outwitted and played right into their hands. Instead, it feels like Esselmont intentionally made every choice to undercut the drama and the excitement of the scene. The assassination amounts to Lacine sprinkling some eau to Terrell dust and Kellen Ben jumping out of the window. Nobody who was there thinks there's any chance he died, and nobody uh, who wasn't there would even know that it actually happened. And to top it all off, the whole anticlimax happens off page. The problem of demystifying something and making it less interesting is super common in prequels, of course but is also the source of a lot of my nitpicks in Esselmont's books. I think Erickson is pretty masterful at knowing where to shine the narrative spotlight and when to leave something vague or abstract. But in Night of Knives and Return of the Crimson Guard, I ran into a couple frustration points where Esselmont sort of firmed something up in a way that I didn't think clicked well with the Malazan Book of the Fallen. It's made me really hesitant to read The Path to Ascendancy, despite how well Dancer's Lament was received. So... That was a long comment, so thanks, CMETs. Um, and I think it really got at a lot of what we were discussing before. Yep. And I wonder what you think about his kind of take. I, even though I really like the book, pretty much agree with a lot of what he said. You know, I really understand how he feels. Absolutely. No, I think this is a, A, I think it's a beautifully written comment. This person is a <laughs> has a way with words. But also, like, I, I totally get it you know it's uh it 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 kind of it is it's anticlimactic i think that was the perfect word that they used to describe this right is that that's kind of for me the the whole point and and it really i think comes down to your perspective coming into it what your expectations were um because taking it in the perspective or in the context of the, the whole kind of 26 or whatever book of the series that we're on and what the overarching messages are and, and things like that. I love it because it fits in, I think, with a lot of those big themes that I talked about already that I don't want to beat to death, but, you know, that they're, that these are, that they're all fallible, that in some ways the gods are, um, you know, more human than the humans, that the humans are more noble 
than the gods that uh, that you know that people live for meaning and for purpose and things like that. You know that 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 seeing these uh, things that were legendary, like the formation of the bridge burners or this um, path to ascendancy, this double cross, this thing that made us hate Lacine so bad, um, you know, wasn't that big of a deal. It kind of you know, takes the wind out of our sails and in the same way that like finding out that she wasn't the total villain that we thought she was at the beginning of Gardens of the Moon takes the wind out of our sails. But I think from a contextual standpoint, that's kind of the point. I I agree. And we've kind of ran through that point. So but I agree. Well, written comment. I appreciated him sending uh, that in. Do you want to ask this last question? And then I am going to transition us into a, a kind of final segment for us. Gramophone said Night of Knives was frustrating. On on the one hand, the horror atmosphere is fantastic, as are some of the visual scenes he sets up, like the old man singing on his boat in the storm. The hounds are properly terrifying, and Temper to Sem's backstory is really cool. On the other hand, Kiska's annoying. Naive twit of a protagonist, the entire Storm Rider subplot served no purpose connected to nothing, and then was deuce ex machina away by powerful beings implied to be gods of some sort, despite having no apparent connection to the established pantheon or any other plot point. It's all just kind of there. Plus, his word choices, especially surrounding the use of magic, Warren magics, and the Talon Imas reverence, do not like. It's been a while, but I also seem to recall Kiska using names, titles of different set of gods in her curses and prayers than literally any other Malazan character in the series, which is jarring and makes no sense in universe. It's an interesting point about the magic words. I hadn't really thought about it, but to me, that's kind of classic. I feel like Malazan's always has like 30 words for the same thing, um, but I can kind of get being chafed at it. I'm going to stand up for for Etzelmont here. And again, this goes back to, I think, what I said at the very, very beginning with my and I'm I'm going to stick to this. Honestly, I'm going to die on this hill. But I think my, you know, Erickson is Ganos and Tavor as Esselmont, where even, you know, he he defers to Esselmont on his notes, on his lore. And so I think for someone to disagree with Esselmont on the basis of knowledge of the lore or use of terms or verbiage, that's that's the hill I'm willing to die on because even Erickson defers to to Esselmont, it seems to me, on on those things. And so even if you don't like his writing style, I think you got to accept that, that that's canon. Oh, I'm sure it's canon, but I do get how it can be confusing for the reader, which I think is always a fair point when you bring up how many names things have in the world, you know? As a, as a Malzan YouTuber, I can tell you the number one comment I get is that I've screwed up the words. Oh, you're telling me, man. We're reading Midnight Tides. My pronunciations are just, <laughs> I don't know. It's so hard. And sometimes, like, I don't know, most people are pretty understanding and cut us some slack. But just some of these names, you know, some of these names. That's um, why I love Kyle. You know, I, I love him as a character, but I also love him for making my life a lot easier. Which is funny because Repav on Reddit commented Ola, Oleg is definitely one of the top 10 worst names in the Malazan universe. Same um, with Kyle. People hate Kyle. They hate Oleg. They hate Kyle. If you can pronounce it, they don't like it. It's true. As much as I complain about the hard names, I've always found the Kyle thing a bit jarring. That's what we call Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> um, so, uh... You know, I did want to shout out quick four questions for you here. You ready? Got them all posted. Number one, this is from Child of Honor. Number one, how did you feel about the shift in tone and writing going from Erickson to Esselmont? That's why I think you you go publication order. You read the Book of the Fallen first and then go Esselmont. And I think you, you don't have the change in tone. For me, that's the more jarring piece. Rather than sticking chronologically, it's the change in tone that will set you off. So stay with one tone, then go to the other tone and enjoy them all. Number two, after reading the book, what or who do you think the Storm Riders are? God bless. I don't know. If you find out, 
email me. Number three, do you feel like you have more of a grasp on some of the sideline characters from the main stories like Tatrin and Lassine? Absolutely. I think this book does a, a awesome job of putting Tatrin in particular in a perspective, right? You get his same smugness and you get a little bit of his kind of uh, overarching goals or his commitment to the greater good. So, yeah, I think it was brilliant on that front. Last question. What is your favorite scene from the book and why is it Temper's flashback? Because Temper's flashback is the bomb. Again, that one's screaming out for an adaptation. All right. So this brings me to the last comment I wanted to read to transition us in. Nil Frog, a Malzahn community member, always posting. Shout out. We was talking to him the other day. God Um, bless him. Yeah. He said, first off, Kiss Kiss, better than Crocus all day, any day, forever. Once again, Agreed. obviously the wrong opinion. You know, don't don't at me. Anyway, that's not what the show's about. He says, otherwise, love that book. I wish people stopped judging it as an appendix to the Book of the Fallen. He's the number one person who always tells me to, and, and I constantly get chided to not call it the main 10. And I think... Uh, he has a beat on Erickson because I think that's that's kind of how Steve would probably call it, you know. But but for me, I think that uh, that was just how I came to it. And but but I I totally feel the sentiment too because I'm a huge Ice fan and I think that he is way underappreciated. Again, look at my Ganos Tavor analogy. She was like the more competent. Even Ganos was bigging up Tavor. Right. Um, and yeah. and so, yeah, I think the reason I read that comment last was because to me, there's this question about whether the book is going to rise to depict this mythic event or what it's like. But when we're t- going to talk about Esselmont, I think fundamentally the question that hangs over his work are how to define them in relationship to Erickson's work and what they really mean, you know, and to clarify what I mean, obviously. And I think this is the feeling a lot of people have is that they are secondary. They are the younger brother. They are an appendix to the series. They are just some more books. Do you know what I mean? Yep. And to be honest, we almost named this miniseries six more books, you know, because we thought it was kind of fun and we wanted to kind of use our 10 very big books title. But the reason we with we, the reason ultimately I told my, our producer AJ I didn't want to use that title is because I felt like that title played exactly into this pitfall about sidelining Esselmont's work and not really meeting it on its own terms, but only having a discussion with the work and only engaging with his writing in conversation with Erickson's work. And I feel like that's a framing that really limits the discussion of discussing Esselmont as an author and Esselmont's work in its own right. Absolutely. And God bless you, because I think that Honestly, as we get deeper into these books that there's a lot of stuff. And and again, this goes back to the whole idea of this not being a series that's about any particular destination. It's about the journey, right? And so we explore things that are barely even touched on. These books stand on on their own. When we get to uh, Blood and Bone in particular, which in some ways seems the most obscure, but to me is, is in some ways the most fruitful from the context of the overall, you know, 20, how many ever books we are into this thing that, you know, will... It, it's going to start to make sense. Exactly. So, but I do think it's worth noting, right? I don't know about you and how you feel about these books. You know, I know you said you're a pretty big fan, right? But I think meeting them, meeting Esselmont's work on its own terms is an ideal that I want to have for our miniseries. And um, the thing is, though, I think it's also pretty hard to get out from talking about them in the context of Erickson, comparing comparing Erickson and Esselmont's writing, which is so different. And to truly have an independent discussion, I think is something I can say I want to go about, but I also feel like always in the back of my head, there's going to be this voice bringing up Erickson's work and those 10 very big books. Do you know what I mean? 
Definitely. And I think they're always going to be interconnected. That's the reason why you you care about it, right? There was several books that you can be invested in before it even gets to the time to read Night of Knives, even if you go by the, the generous kind of mix it in reading orders. And so I, I, I think that uh, they're companion pieces to each other. I don't look at one as a sidekick or the other. They're they work together. Yeah, it's interesting. A uh, sidekick is an interesting way to describe it. I think that's um, another way it's definitely described commonly. Um, yeah, and it's hard because... Hmm. I think it's also worth addressing. We've kind of mentioned it. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how to put it in a softer way, so I'll put it bluntly. I think a lot of people don't like these books, you know? And I, by that, I mean a lot of people don't like Malazan, right? And I think they bounce off it for one reason or the other, right? And I pretty much understand a lot of reasons, you know? Not everything's going to be their cup of tea, blah, blah, yep. blah, 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 you know? But I, I totally agree, and I think that it, it comes down to where we are, which this is so cliche, but I think, honestly, that's the whole point of these books is speaking to us as like where we are as a society and and i think this whole kind of uh binge culture has kind of in a way uh ruined people to the idea of malazan in the first place but also to the ice books right because if you're so obsessed with i'm going to consume it i'm going to find out that final you know, conclusive one singular moment that define this series where Neo goes into the Matrix or Frodo throws the thing into the volcano or or whatever. Like that's not what this it's not about those singular moments and even more so I think with with these books which are about like demystifying specific events that we know about from what the is quote unquote the main series then you're gonna be uh disappointed if you can get into them from the standpoint of under you know wanting to just dig in and enjoy and kind of luxuriate in the lore and the backstory and the questions that that things like power and discovery and and confidence and things like that pose then then you will enjoy it and i think you know, obviously, people, I don't know, I haven't read all these Esselman books. Maybe we're, we're going to be here a few months later, and I'm going to be like, man, I don't like blood and bone, blah, 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 blah. You know, who knows, right? But I think, for me, the reason I think I bring up the fact that I think Esselman's work has its um, detractors, I think it's different than the people who want to take away Erickson's work, or, or not, or, or don't bounce off Erickson. I think what's surprising me about it is a, there's a lot of fans who love the book of the Fallen, but don't enjoy Esselman's work, right? Yeah. Um, and I think, to me, there's two things to go off of there. I think you really touched on your first, you touched on it a bit, in that some people definitely are coming for the backstory and coming to, I think, probably learn mm, lore almost, you know? Yeah. And I think it's as I said, I think Esselmont has clearly, in my mind, made the decision to not just write long Wikipedia articles, you know, which I think's the stronger decision. He's here to write a novel. Do you know what I mean? Yep. Um, and I'm sure he has something he wants to say more than here's what Kellen Vett and Dancer did. Do you know what I mean? Yep. And then I think the second biggest point is that the books are written in such totally different styles. You know, it's almost it's it's almost comical how different they are, you know? Absolutely. And I think, you know, again, this gets back to the idea of like people, it, 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 it's kind of an expectations game, right? Because I think that you can't divorce yourself from that uh, experience of reading the Erickson side where there's deep and ponderous questions, if you read them in publication order or not, it, you know, you've, you've gotten fairly deep into the series of these big philosophical issues and um, not, you know, open ended stories where he doesn't get give you the final conclusion and things like that to a more uh, fast paced kind of, you know, 
action packed and and kind of hit you in the in the in the funds if you will type of a, a story to to wonder why this isn't like a, a toll the hounds but but honestly these are are good in and of of themselves and i think part of it comes down to just again we're expecting one thing we we associate malazan with a certain writing style and that was the first four books that we read Exactly. To me, when I think about what defines a Malazan story, you know, there's these elements where like, oh, maybe we're in Darugistan or something. Yes. But Erickson's writing style is like such a huge definitive part about what defines the series. Do you know I mean the series has such a distinct style that you know it by how it's written, right? It's like it's it's very unique to, to, to the genre in a way. And um I think, therefore, when you enter a different style, it, it, like even if Esselmont was writing any different way, I just think reading the same setting in a different style is an adjustment you have to make and come to terms with. And I think either you're going to bounce off it or you're going to enter uh, and read Esselmont's work in a different way than you read Erickson's. And that th- and that's all to say, I, I kind of understand why people bounce off it if they're expecting toll the hounds yep you like right return of the crimson guard night of the knives these are very different books than something like dust of dreams do you mean like especially those later entries in the book of the fallen um there's just a real contrast in the stylistic approaches the two authors are taking so i think that's something i'm really keeping my eye on and i think it's something i really look forward to discussing with you as we get further along in this series in discussing this fundamental question about where does esselmont's work fall and how how can you have this discussion in an independent sense yeah and i think that he'll uh time time will be his friend on that front because i think that they're good books you know what i mean people who uh give them a chance and read them i think will enjoy them even the path to ascendancy which he got a lot of flack for i enjoyed the first couple books i enjoyed Glenn Bed's reach and and I think time's going to be his friend. What's I think the community a lot of opinions like people like the first one but they feel like it gets a little worse. I don't know. I I feel like that's what a lot of people say, but I not 100%. I I think he did a, a good job. My biggest critique is the same thing I could throw in about all these books, which is that he could have fleshed them out even more and had even chunkier uh books. I get why people don't like him, but I think that's mostly again rooted in how they're approaching them yeah but we can uh we can all sort that out later on so any closing thoughts about night of knives where this book falls in the greater malazan pantheon or any closing comments on this book absolutely love the book i think it's uh, a lot of fun i again i'm a sucker for the lore and the backstory and i think that uh this is really contextually an an awesome entry because it's it fits right in with the theme of this idea that the gods are more human than us right and that uh, and you get to see that firsthand you get to see uh empresses as fallible humans you get to see uh gods created from again fallible egotistical human beings you get to see those moral center characters it's fun it's fast paced i think that uh for me it's right up there i feel about the same way i've expressed my opinion throughout the show i think it's a lot of fun and if anything, I'm kind of glad it's not as mythic as I once thought it was. And I think I'm kind of glad that there's been a few years between I first read the first three of these Esselmont books. So I think it kind of gave me perspective in how I want to think about approaching reading these novels, of the Malazan Empire, and talking with you about them. So um, thanks for uh, thanks for making the show today. Hey, thank you so much. And if anybody has any theories about those Storm Riders, I am all ears. Yeah, me too. And. That brings me to my final point, and I wanted to clarify how we're going to roll out this mini series. So I think the plan is, as of now, in December 2020, subject to change, we're having uh, some original art done up for the mini series, and we're going to try and release shows between me and Escar discussing the novels of the Malzan Empire um, throughout most of 2021, hopefully every two or three months. 
and they'll be available for everyone on YouTube and uh, wherever you get your podcasts. And it's worth addressing two important points. First, this show, Iskar's working with us, but it's really made possible by the people who are backing 10 Very Big's books on Patreon. So I really wanted to thank them and say that uh, although we make some shows just for our Patreon uh, subscribers, we just wanted to, this show is for everyone and we're just giving it out because we're spreading the mouths and love. So that's where we're at. And uh, so th- big thanks to everyone and thanks for understanding that. And our second point is to address the maybe a question that I've been asked before. Which is, you know, me and Niskar are going to read through the novels of the Malazan Empire. But as you well know, Asomat wrote more than six books. You know, there's lo- lots of books out there. And I believe the Gistel uh, is not yet out, but it was supposed to be out this year. I actually don't know the status of the book. Do you? It was supposed to be out in November. They canceled my pre-order, but we're eagerly awaiting the new drop. It should be, I think it's a, a backlog and we should get it soon. Exactly. Uh, I'm hoping it can get out. I know a lot of people are looking forward to that. But to get the question I was getting at is, you know, what about all these other books? The The 10 Very Big Books podcast is going through all 10. And we go through them pretty slowly because we read through them. It takes a few months. But obviously, me and Iskar discussed this whole book in one episode. So at the end of these six books, maybe it's going to be about a year from now. Maybe we'll read some more Esselmont books. I don't know. I don't know what's happening with the other Malazan books. It's a big TV determined. So that's the status of everything. In 2021, look for new Esselmont read-throughs about every two or three months. That's right. Let's get it. And uh, let us know what you think of the show. Leave a comment. Tweet at us. send us Send us an email. And we hope everyone's staying safe this year. And here's to 2021. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Hello, everybody. AJ here, producer and editor of 10 Very Big Books. Thank you so much for listening to the first episode of Discussions of the Malazan Empire. Special shout out as well to Iskar Jarek for agreeing to come on the show and co-host it with Peter. It's always a joy to have him. You can check out Iskar on YouTube, youtube.com slash Iskar Jarek. Uh, He also has a Discord server, subreddit, Facebook page, Patreon, and merch store, all of which will be linked in the show notes. If you'd like to join 10 Very Big Books Discord, you can head on over to bit.ly slash v bb discord that's capital v capital b capital b capital d discord that link will also be in the show notes along with links to our patreon patreon.com slash 10 very big books if you'd like to support the show there like peter said the series is made possible by our wonderful patrons so thank you all so so much for allowing us to do more and continue to grow this show into the new year and of course i want to thank my good friend bokeh for allowing us to use his song winter off of his new release demos and singles 2016 to 2020 you can follow him on Twitter at Brendan Bigley and check out his podcast that I also produce over on IntoTheCast.online. And finally, a huge, humongous, gigantic thanks to our resident fan of the opera scholar, Scout Wilkinson, for making our absolutely incredible episode art. You can check out more of her work on Twitter at HumbleGoat and on her coffee page, co-fi.com slash HumbleGoat. All of those links will be in the show notes, of course. And Pete and Iskar will be back in a couple of months with the next discussion of the Malazan Empire, where they'll be talking about Return of the Crimson Guard by Ian Cameron Esselmont. I'll talk to you then, and thank you so much for listening.